Introduction to HPE Nimble Storage Asynchronous Replication. And again, we're going to be focused on asynchronous, which is snapshot-based snapshot replication as opposed to the pure persistent synchronous replication. Um, so the, the marketing term they use is smart replicate, and the idea is to be able to snapshot, replicate those snapshots so that the volume and the snapshots are then, uh, there's a copy of those um, on another nimble storage array or another couple nimble storage arrays or in our HPE cloud volumes platform. So you can replicate directly to the cloud as well. Um, the, the, the idea, the design philosophy is to try to simplify data protection as much as possible. Obviously, you want to be following the 321 rule when it comes to overall data protection, but for tier zero data protection, right, the fastest restore um, capabilities, you really could simplify what we've seen in, in legacy type of approaches to this by simply doing very lightweight snapshots, replicating those to another, another um, data center um, or another location, and then you know replicating those snapshots right along with it um, and you can get down to pretty low rpos the rtos are going to be completely dependent upon how much data needs to be restored and what your tool set is that you're using to do that restore so but again the nice part about this is even just to get to this point where i got a copy off site and a point in time that has integrity that i can get back to doesn't require a backup window um, and uh, you can do very quick restores um, of the data set itself. Um, one of the nice pieces about this um, from, from a nimble standpoint is that you don't have to have like for like on both sides. The data services that support snapshotting and replication on the Nimble platform run on all the Nimble arrays. So you could have an all flash system and replicate to an all flash or an adaptive flash, or you could go from an AF60 to an AF40. So if you don't need as much performance at the DR site, you could do that. It's very WAN efficient because what are you sending across? Only the snapshots, which is only the changes, only the deltas. Um, and so it's going to be optimized from that standpoint. Yes, the initial time that you take a snapshot, you're going to have to copy the entire data set that's in the volume. That's true. And for new deployments, um, what's very common is for people to set up both arrays in the same data center on a, on a high throughput LAN, do a snap and replicate of the primary data set or the initial data set, then redeploy the replica to the DR site. And then you start changing uh, or sending the changes um, from that point forward. That being said, you don't need to do that. I've seen deployments go where they were replicating over small, over MPLS circuits, and it took four weeks for them to do their initial replication, but it didn't matter. The, the replicas won't fail. It's, it's made to do that. There's not like any kind of time dependency or latency dependency on the Nimble itself. And in fact, I've had the question say, well, what's the, what's the minimum or what's the maximum latency that asynchronous replication will support? on a Nimble storage array or between two Nimble storage arrays? And the, the answer is there isn't a limitation. Um, I've seen people replicate on T1s. And yeah, it, there's a high lag time, but it doesn't mess up the replication process. The Nimbles don't care. They will just send the data until all the data gets there is basically how that works. Um, there are multiple ways that you can do replication. So I'll build these all out. You can do, you know, basically a production to DR type of scenario, a, you know, a unidirectional. You can also do this, the split out where you can do one system replicating out to two. It is a max of two today and how that works. One of these can be a physical. And one of them could actually be the cloud if you wanted it to be. You can do a many to one. This is very common for distributed systems where you've got multiple small nimbles at remote sites and then you do a replication back to a primary site. So you make sure you've got a, you know, a primary DR protection of all those remote sites. Um, or bi-directional, which is my favorite um, because it's the, I feel like it's the best use of all your resources. Um, you can basically be running production at both sites and they can be protecting each other. So all of those are supported from an asynchronous replication standpoint. Um, when you're setting up replication, there's kind of, three main components in this. One is the partner, right? And that's really just dictates what's the relationship. This array has a relationship with another array. And so this is the partner of the other one and they're a partner of each other, right? 
um, if you're doing you know both ways. Once you configure replication, bi-directional replication is automatically configured. So you can do that. It doesn't take additional configuration. So obviously you have to have another array to partner with. You have to have a snapshot schedule in order for this to work. And then there's also some capabilities around throttling. You can basically design your solution to use the amount of bandwidth that you want it to. When you configure your partner, um, pretty straightforward. Uh, this is all under the, the volume collection section. There's a part for volume configuration. You put in the partner's name. This is required. So this would be the array uh, or the group name that you're replicating to put in. I always like to put in descriptions. I noticed that in all the screenshots, they always leave this blank. I'm just kind of one of those uptight engineers. I like putting in an explanation of what it is I'm configuring. So the next guy or gal isn't confused. Um, put in the IP address, which is going to be the replication IP on where you're going to. By default, that's usually the administrative interface um, on the other system. And then a shared secret. Now, this shared secret really is just a passphrase that they're going to share with each other. You'll put it in on one side, then you'll log into the partner array, and you'll put it in on that side. Once they both have that same partner secret, they share it with each other, they negotiate their replication tunnel, and you're off and going. It usually takes anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes for that negotiation process to complete. This, it's, it's what we would call a low priority service running on an array. Uh, the hosting I.O. for your applications is the high priority. So that's all you got to do. Once that's done, you now have a partner relationship between two systems. It's a very similar process to doing this with the cloud volumes as well. And um, uh, you know, that now you're ready to start replicating and you can choose a rep that replication partner to start replicating out of your um, volume collections. Um, let's see here. So you can limit bandwidth through the throttle. You can do scheduling parameters on the throttle as well so that you only replicate during certain times of day. And um, let's see here. Existence is mutually exclusive with array throttles. A system can contain array-wide throttles. Oh, or partner-wide. That's right. So you can throttle by partner or you can throttle for whatever the array is itself. So yeah, you have some, you have some granularity, right, on how you control how bandwidth is used. Um, there is a test button in the GUI that lets you test whether or not replication is working um, before you actually start sending data across. And basically, it tests the handshake and that you've got a good IP path. Uh, keep in mind that asynchronous replication on a nimble storage array is IP based. This is it's not done over fiber channel, so it does require an IP based path between the two arrays, which is why by default it runs on the administrative interface. You can have dedicated interfaces though for replication. You can basically set up, um, you know, an, another network on your um, on your array, apply interfaces to that network, and then you can choose that network as your replication network. Um, when you log into the array, there, you can look and see when you go into partners what your partner status is. Um, there, you, you know, it basically utilizes that test, that same process that you utilize when you hit the test button, but every so often it's going to be checking in with the partner whether it's replicating something or not, just to make sure that that's up and running. Um, uh, successful replicated configuration, it's, so every four hours, right, is when it's going to be checking in. Um, if you are, there's going to be some kind of maintenance on your network and um, you don't want the arrays to keep trying to replicate when you know that there's a link that's going to be down or you're changing something in your infrastructure, uh, maybe it's even just a routing change or something like that, you can log into the array and pause replication on the array. And um, which is kind of nice, right? Because if you don't pause and there's a disruption, um, you actually could get auto support cases from InfoSight, right? Once replication starts failing after a certain amount of time, it will start generating cases and sending you ways that you can troubleshoot replication. Um, so before the 5.2 code came out, um, the default was management IP for replication. Um, that there isn't a default now, you actually assign it um, since we've, you know, since we've upgraded to the new code. Mm. And, oh, actually, and this is something I, I did point out that you can do the pausing on the replication. 
but you can't do it by volume, right? It's by partner. So either you're replicating to that partner or you're not. Um, so, so replication data only networks starting in the 5.2. So since that time, right, when the default isn't the admin necessarily anymore, to eliminate the need for management IP for replication, um, so this is a lot easier, specifically targeting service providers, management ports on the internal networks, um, uh, replication to cloud volumes already included in the functionality. So with this new code, basically you just have the ability to choose what networks you're going to connect over and what hosts um, from the get-go, from the initial configuration, rather than going in and modifying the default configuration, which was the admin interface. Um, this is what the QoS settings look like. When you go in, here's your bandwidth limit, bandwidth limit limitation. Um, again, you can put in your description, you can put in your throughput limitation, and also you can put in intervals of when it's okay to, um, to replicate and when it's not. And there's multiple policies, right, that you can add. Um, what else we got in here? Um, replication partner, right? Um, we showed this before, but that's configured and dictated within the volume collection of where it is you're going to replicate to. Um, yeah, and so because this is dictated at the volume collection level, not at the schedule level, just keep in mind that when you when you do this, um, this you know this collection can only replicate to one partner so you can't have one schedule replicating to one partner and one schedule replicating to another partner which would then mean that a particular volume can only replicate to one place even if the array can replicate to multiple yeah so if you're going to do fan out replication right and you're going to replicate from an array to multiple arrays just keep in mind right that you can um, replicate volume three to two to two different places, right? But they require two different volume collections to do that, right? And they're going to be different versions because they're using two different volume collections to do that. So um, this kind of a triangle setup of being able to pass replicas around allows you to take three data centers and create basically a fault tolerant solution for your storage um, or for your data all the way around. So with the, um, the fan out replication capabilities in the 5.2, right, in this rather than having the replication partner dictated up here, which was what it was when I showed you in the previous screenshot, um, you will, um, you can, you actually dictate that down here in the schedule. So here's your replication time, and then you put in here what your replication partner is for each individual schedule. So this is how you're able to take a single volume and actually replicate it out to two different places by dictating it in different schedules. Yep, there it is. So here's the two different arrays that it's partners with and you can choose that per schedule. Um, so the replication creates copies of volumes on a separate, separate array. So I already kind of pointed this out before. When you do an official, an initial snap and replication, it will copy basically the entire data set, the whole volume, and then it will only do the deltas or the changes from that point forward. Um, there are two different processes associated with this. And do keep this in mind that when we're talking about snapshot replication, it is asynchronous. So you're, there's going to be that RPO so if you're only taking a snapshot every hour, then only every hour are you gonna be sending data across. Um, there's two different processes associated with that. There's the management, that's the scheduling piece, which is really the part that manages the volume collections. And then there's the data mover piece, which is the, data, the part that actually moves the data from one array to the other array. Um, 
and I already talked about we can support that the you know the one to one or the the bi directional or the end to one type of solutions the fan in the one to one. Um, uh, one nice thing though is replica volumes can be brought online um, at the same time that the primary volumes are online as well. Um, that's not a you know that that's not necessarily a true DR, but if you wanted to simply migrate or bring an um, a data set online at the replica, even though it's still online at the primary site, you can do that. There's nothing to stop that from happening. So we already talked about creating the replica partner. Um, subsequent changes, setting up the replication partner in the in the new version basically looks the same as what in the previous snapshot or screenshot that I showed you. Um, if you are replicating to a group that has multiple pools, you do in this process have the ability to dictate which pool is going to be the inbound location or where the snapshots will land. Um, and again, that's in a grouped situation if there are multiple arrays in a group. To, let's see, we're at time. I'm just going to look and see if there's anything else here I haven't already talked to. Um, replica status, we already pointed out, right, when you look at your snapshot collections, the replica of even the process of replicating or when the replication finished is all showed right here in this column. And if there isn't, um, it's either going to be completed, it's going to be pending, right, meaning it's waiting because it will not run all of them at once. If Sometimes if there was a network outage, snapshots for the same volume might actually get backed up or for the same volume collection might get backed up and might be waiting for um, you know, the, the snapshot ahead of it to replicate. So that would be, it would show up pending in that particular case. Print progress obviously is copying the data across, or it might say any where the upstream or the non-replicable the non or downstream always shows the status. So basically if there is, if the link is down between them, you're gonna get an NA status on that because it can't communicate. All right. And when you look at this from a snapshot standpoint, it's either gonna be show the little clock here meaning it's working on it it's in transit or and that could be pending or in progress um, or it's going to have the green check or it's going to be failed right so something to keep in mind if you have grouped arrays if you're doing scale out you cannot do asynchronous replication inside of a group replication inside of a group can only be synchronous the um if you have a group and you want to split it apart and start doing asynchronous replication, you'll have to do just that. One of the arrays will need to leave the group in order to do that. I'm not gonna dig into the background processes. So these next set of slides, um, and this will be the end of it, and then we can wrap up. Um, is really just going to talk, go through all the different scenarios of what about how is your data being stored on one side of a replication versus another, and how is the array going to handle that particular piece? So, for instance, if I have an old array that doesn't do deduplication, but I use deduplication on my production array, what if I replicate between those? Because it's supported, they don't even have to be running the same software, by the way. You can do asynchronous replication, have different arrays and different software on either side. Um, but I mean, what if you've got no dedupe and no encryption? What does that look like? I because mean, obviously it's going to have to send, you know, keys. Like we want to, everything's being sent and replicated encrypted. And so what, is that, what does that look like? Or how does the dedupe um, metadata and, and whatnot work as it gets to the other side? So if it's not encrypted, it's not deduped, it's just going to, you know, re, uh, rehydrate it if it's been compressed and send the data across, right? Um, let me pop back in that, sorry. All right, so that's just gonna keep going. Um, if we do, if we got dedupe on one side, no encryption, it's just gonna send that piece across and, and it will actually rehydrate that data and then re-dedupe it on the other side is what it will do because the dedupe metadata is held per array and per pool. Um, in this particular case, it's not shared. So it's not global deduplication amongst all nimbles. Each nimble has its own deduplication um, 
metadata. Uh, encryption is going to be similar. It will go across. What it actually does in this particular process is it will rehydrate, it will decrypt that data, and it will um, re-encrypt it with the downstream arrays um, uh, key because it will share that key back in that partnership relationship. It will send it across encrypted, and then it will store it encrypted on the other side. So everything stays encrypted in that whole process. So there is a rehydration or an undedupe change that needs to go into play if you're doing dedupe on one side, not on the other. And so it will be stored deduped here, but it's not gonna be stored deduped on the far side, right? So there will be kind of a, a rehydration that goes there. Encryption will work the same way. Um, so if there isn't any encryption supported on this array, but there is on this one, it will actually send it across encrypted with this array's key and keep it encrypted even though this array doesn't, doesn't do encryption. So again, the, the promise is that once it's encrypted, it will stay encrypted while it's inside the Nimble ecosystem. So decrypt, undedupe, re-encrypt, and then send it across. That's how that's gonna work. So what does that really mean? It means that the Nimble has built in that no matter what the features or capabilities of the different arrays are that are in that replication relationship, it's going to make sure that there's data integrity. It's gonna utilize deduplication wherever it can and data that's encrypted will be able to stay encrypted whether it's in flight in replication or whether it's actually stored on the underlying disk. And the Nimble will manage all that stuff. You don't have to do anything with it. So the, the last piece I'm gonna hit here for the next couple minutes, I know we're just a few minutes over, but stick with me here, is this concept of handover, promote, and demote. Within the volume collection, when you set up replication, asynchronous replication, there is kind of a built-in DR operation. It doesn't necessarily bring applications online, but it will bring your volumes online, and it will manage the relationship between the two arrays that are in that replication relationship. So handing over is when both arrays are still up and running, there's a graceful transition where volume one, right, which is being created on, in the production data center. If you wanna move it to the, the DR data center, you go into the volume collection. One of the options at the top is handover. They will negotiate a handshake, say, hey, are you there? And they'll say, yeah, I'm here. I'm gonna give you this volume and you're gonna own it now. Okay, I'll take the volume, I'm gonna own it. It will ask you, do you want to reverse replication during that process? And you can say yes or no. If you say yes, then it will bring the volume online at the DR site and start reversing replication back. So it's a very switch e easy way to migrate a workload when both systems are up and running, migrate a workload from one data center to the other, or in the case of if an application is down but the array is not, you need to bring it up on resources in the other data center, you can do that piece as well, simply using a handover when they're both up. Now, if one of the arrays is down, right, and all you have is the replica, there is a process you go through for that as well. That is called promote. So you will log into the, vo the volume, log into the array, go to the volume collection of the systems that you want to bring online or the volumes you want to bring online at the replica. One of the options at the top as you select a volume collection will be promote. And basically it's like doing a handover only when the original array is not on is not on, is not online. So that promote option will, the first thing it will actually do is it will check to see if the other system is online. And if the other system is online, it'll ask you, are you sure you don't wanna do a handover? Um, because that's gonna be more graceful, right? There'll be more, you know, we'll, we'll have all the checksums and the data integrity in, in place for that. But if that system's down, it'll say, okay, well, we're going to promote. Now we are going to own the data. So now the secondary array or the DR array owns the data and it's been promoted to the owner. And at that point in time, you can start doing snapshots. You can bring it online, you can reconnect it to your hosts, you can re-index your VMs, whatever you need to do out of that particular volume to get your applications up and running. And it now owns the data. From its standpoint, it's not a replica anymore. At that point, let's say though that your production, DR, your production site comes back online. It now thinks it owns the data, right? But the DR site says, no, I own the data, I've been promoted. So there's a little bit of infighting potentially there. So you log into the initial production system, 
you go to the volume collection and you choose the demote option. So now you're clearing the ownership. You're saying, no, you think you're in charge, you're not. I promoted him, he's in charge. And at that point in time, you can actually then start replicating back. Because both systems are back up and running, the DR site's been promoted, the um, production site has been demoted. Once they are synced up, right? And both systems are up and running. You've got snapshots, all the data, um, new data that's been changed at the DR site is now synced up with your production site. Now you want to move back, right? So what do we do? Both systems are up and running. We want to change that relationship. So we go back to handover. We log into the volume collection on the site that owns the data. So at the DR site, we go to handover and it switches it back. So that is the built-in DR operations associated with asynchronous replication and snapshotting on the Nimble storage array. Very straightforward. Again, it doesn't necessarily automate the online of all the applications, but it does automate the process of who owns the volume and which volumes are online and not online and which direction replication is running. That's how that works. Any questions on replication or more specifically DR operations around replication?